Uh, okay, so um, I know that uh, Saussure was probably not, it was a, you know, it's a long read and it's not an easy one. Um, so why don't we start with any questions that you guys have about this? Is there anything that you found unclear, confusing, or even particularly interesting? Okay, so that's kind of exactly what we were talking about a minute ago when we talked about um, the difference between studying changes in language over time and studying language at a particular moment in time, like, like freezing it in a particular moment and seeing how it works right now, right? So a diachronic approach. to linguistics is essentially a uh, historical or evolutionary approach. Right? You are looking at the way different languages in the same family gradually separate off from each other. You are looking at changes within a given language over time. Like for example, um, if you were a specialist in um, English language linguistics in the late 19th century, you would probably be primarily concerned with how various dialects of Anglo-Saxon evolve into various dialects of Middle English, which then evolves into Modern English, right? You'd be tracing those kinds of changes. Um, Saussure is not interested in doing this kind of work. And he doesn't think that this kind of work actually tells us much that's all that useful about the way people actually communicate. Right? It's of historical interest. I mean, he's not saying that this particular work isn't valuable. It's just not what he's interested in. He's trying to move the discipline in a different direction. So a synchronic approach. Right? Think of it this way. Like, you know, if you and your friend Oh, people don't really do this anymore, do you? Do they? You know, people don't have watches. <laughs> Shit. Um, I'm trying to think of a different thing. Do you know what it means to synchronize your watch or synchronize yeah. your clock with somebody else? Okay, so if you're synchronizing all of your of all of the clocks in your house, say, you are getting all of them to try to read exactly the same time, right? So think of it. Think of synchronic linguistics in those terms. So like all at one time. Right, synchronic linguistics is concerned with the state of language at a particular moment. And that moment doesn't have to be the present moment. Right, there are, you could do synchronic linguistic studies on, say, past versions of a particular language. You can still do like say, you know, synchronic linguistic studies on, you know, old high German or on Anglo-Saxon or on Latin or you know, other languages that people don't speak anymore. But the whole idea here is that for Saussure, who wants to understand how a linguistic system operates, the best way to do that is to look at the right now, rather than to look at how things have changed over the past. So does this clarify the synchronic diachronic issue for you? Yeah. So yeah, the only kind of work us here is doing is synchronic. Other questions before I start starting with anything? Okay, so um, that was confusing for me too. Okay, so maybe we sort of continue with a little bit of uh, history lesson here, then, right? Because this is all coming out of historical tendencies in the study of language. Um, so, how many of you know what a philologist is? A what? Philologist. Philologist. I didn't even know that was a word. 
It's in a reading. Well, that'd be life, though. It is in the reading. Never mind, I'm not going to say anything. It's all stupid. <laughs> no, but, no, but if you have a guess, go for it. It's Would it be like the study of philosophy? Or no, the, 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 the philologist isn't a philosopher. Um, it's, um, philology is the ancestor discipline of both like English literary studies and modern linguistics. It used to be like if you did one, you did both. Um, and in fact, most literary artifacts in modern languages were regarded as of interest mostly as linguistic artifacts. Um, how many of you uh, are familiar, for example, with J.R.R. Tolkien? Okay, most of you oh. right, have read The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, right? Mm -hmm. Tolkien was a philologist at Oxford. Right? That was his day job when he wasn't you know, writing stories about small people with furry feet. Um, he was, uh, in particular, sort of a specialist in um, Anglo-Saxon language. And he, sort of better than most, kind of united the two halves of the discipline, was able to demonstrate that um, Old English poems like Beowulf uh, were actually interesting as literary artifacts in and of themselves, as artistic and cultural <coughs> artifacts, rather than simply examples of you know, the state of the language at the time the poem was written. Um, but essentially, by the early 1920s, this discipline has kind of gone off in two different directions. Right, so. Yeah, literary studies and linguistics, thanks in no small part to people like Saussure, become separate pursuits, right? Separate academic pursuits that don't overlap all that much. Um, so, Saussure and an American philosopher, actual philosopher, not philologist, by the name of Charles Wilson Pierce, around the same time, independently of each other, are inventing a new kind of system for the study of symbols that Pierce calls semiotics. And Saussure calls semiology. We tend to use these two words interchangeably now, right? So semiotics, semiology simply means the systematic study of signs. sign is anything that communicates meaning. Okay, everybody's still with me. Any questions so far? All right, so Pierce classifies signs in three ways, right? The first is an iconic sign. An iconic sign functions by means of actual similarity between the, uh, the sign itself and the thing that it signifies, right? So um, for example, um, a portrait of George Washington would be an icon, an iconic sign, because it physically resembles George Washington. Um, a map of a particular area would be an iconic sign representing that area, because it's not all that useful if it doesn't physically represent that area very closely, right? The second kind of sign Pierce calls an index. And an index bear, uh, in an index sign, um, the thing signified 
bears some sort of natural relationship to the signifier, right? To the sign that signifies it. Uh, so, for example, um, if you are, you know, say looking out over a forest and you see a plume of smoke, what does that indicate to you? Yeah, that's an indexical sign, right? That the smoke tells you that there's a fire down below. If you are wandering through the woods and you step in a pile of bear shit, there are bears around, right? The bear shit is an indexical sign that there are bears nearby. Um, a thermometer right, will tell you the temperature because the, the heated or cooled mercury in the tube will reach a certain number, right? That's another, it's an indexical sign. All right, and the third, and probably most complicated, the one with which Saussure is most concerned, um, is what Pierce calls a symbol. With a symbol, the relationship between the two parts, right, the sign itself and the thing signified is dictated solely by social convention. There's no natural relationship between the two. So language would actually be a system of symbolic signs, right? Because there is no natural relationship between our word C-A-T and a furry four-footed mammal with whiskers and pointy ears that likes milk and fish, right? The concept that is conveyed by this word has nothing to do with the symbol we use to convey it, right? The relationship is arbitrary. So a sign for Saussure and for Pierce consists of two parts that are linked by this kind of arbitrary relationship. So a sign is the product of a signifier combined with a signified, where right, the signifier is the means of representation and the signified is the concept you are attempting to communicate. And in a symbolic sign, there is no natural relationship between signifier and signified. It's dictated solely by convention. Uh, and this isn't limited to language either, right? Um, <clears throat> if we look at even some sort of like extra linguistic practices, right? Now, if I walk up and extend my middle finger to you, what does that mean? What am I telling you? Something rather offensive. Yeah, right. It's ba it's you know like basically you know accepted social code for nonverbal fuck you, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, if I walked up to someone in Italy and made the same gesture, it wouldn't phase them. Social convention dictates what that means here. In Italy, if I wanted to, to make the same point to somebody, I would make what's called the sign of the figs, or it'd go like this. Stick my thumb between my fingers and raise my fist. So social convention there dictates that that's the gesture you make if you want to make, you know, say, you know, say something rude to someone without using words. Um, there's no natural relationship right between either of these gestures and the thing conveyed. It's dictated solely by social convention. So then, like, in a place like Italy, to stick it on the middle finger, like, have absolutely no meaning whatsoever? They probably know what it means by now. Oh. Okay. <laughs> given, how, uh, uh, given how pervasive American pop culture is across the globe, they probably, yes, they probably understand the meaning of the gesture now. But that's not the preferred cultural expression of that there. Right. An Italian person would still probably give you the figs rather than the finger. Oh. But it means the same thing. Yeah.
The point I'm trying to make, though, is that the signifier is different. And that relationship is dictated by social use and social convention, not by anything natural, right? Okay, so everybody clear on what a sign is and how that works? No. Yeah, this is, this is, um, a sign is still anything that carries meaning, right? But in order to carry that meaning, right, you have to combine a means of representation with a concept that you're representing. Right, so I can't communicate a concept to you without attaching some kind of signifier to it, right? I have the only means I have to communicate concepts to you or you know, say pictures or words, right? I have to use symbols to communicate with you. Because we haven't advanced to the state where we have telepathy yet, right? Not yet. Working well, on yeah. Work. All right. Working on Keep on that. <clears throat> and if the words I am saying don't aren't attached to any particular concept, right? Then I'm just up here babbling. Right? So a signifier without a signified is meaningless babble. And a signified without a signifier can't be communicated. Does that make sense? Okay. Exactly, yeah. You need yeah, you need both in order to have a sign. So the relationships between signs in a particular system, according to Saussure, are completely arbitrary. They're based on the sign's differences from each other, rather than anything natural to the sign itself, right? So we use the sign cat to denote that particular four-footed furry creature to differentiate it from, right, bat, hat, rat, flat, fat, mat, right. <clears throat> you change one part of the sign, you change the meaning, right? And then, yeah, there's no there's no direct association between the symbol we use for the concept and the concept itself, right? You know, we just, we need to be able to differentiate between different parts of the system. Okay, everybody's still with me. Anybody have any other questions that are related to this or that are related to Saussure in some way? Yes, go ahead. The axis. Okay. Yeah. Can you give me a page number? One forty-seven. One forty-seven. Okay. That kind of like threw me off. Okay. Okay. Let's see. So certainly all sciences would profit by indicating more precisely the coordinates along which their subject matter is aligned. Everywhere distinctions should be made according to the following illustration between one. The axis of simultaneities, which stands for the relations of coexisting things and from which the intervention of time is excluded, and two, the axis of successions, on which only one thing can be considered at a time, but upon which are located all the things on the first axis together with their changes. Okay, so this is just that whole synchronic diachronic thing again, right? The axis of simultaneities, right? He's talking about the state of a whole language at once. At any one given time, yeah and this axis of successions, right? He's talking about this diachronic study of changes in language. If you're studying changes in a language, you kind of have to just focus on one little piece of it at a time and trace the way that word or that grammatical rule evolves um, through different periods of the evolution of the language. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, wor I wouldn't worry too much about the diagram. Uh, the diagram's not actually all that helpful. But yeah, he's talking about the diachronic and synchronic um, distinction there. And look, I mean, like the, the thing, one thing to note about Saussure too is that um, 
what we have of his work. So Saussure, in his own lifetime, never published anything. Right? He was a Swiss university lecturer from, um, I, think, I think he was at the University of Geneva, but I might be mistaken, um, from 1907 to 1911. He died suddenly and quite young in 1911. <laughs> I'm actually not sure if he died, but, but yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he, he, yeah, he, he died young um, and unexpectedly, and so exactly, yeah, his students, um, as a tribute to him, compiled his lectures into a book. Yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, yeah, all, all of this is. Uh, published posthumously, right? Prior to uh, 1916, when the book came out, um, no one outside of Geneva had heard of Ferdinand de Saussure. Um, and his theories on language were known only to his students and his colleagues. But yeah, um, any other questions you guys have? About, there's other stuff I want to cover, but I want to first resolve any difficulties that you're having. Anything else you guys want to know about? Okay, well, um, one of the things, uh, one of the things I asked you about um, last time, which I now realize this translation doesn't actually use these terms. Um, I asked you about the distinction between long and palo. So these are both French words that mean speech. But Saussure uses them to mean different, different kinds, like he's using them to make a kind of distinction between two different usages of language, right? So long refers to the entire system. A given language, right? Vocabulary, grammatical rules, slang, common usages, right? All of those things. Parole refers to a single utterance in a given language. Now, because speakers of a language never sit down and map out the features of that language. For one thing, right, the system is too big. And for another, right, you know, we just we internalize it as we learn to speak and we learn to write. Um, we never really have a grasp of all of long, right? We, we don't, we never see the whole system. We only see it in terms of parole, right? We have to assemble long by examining parole, by examining single utterances, right? So the analogy that Saussure and others have used is sort of is, uh, to chess, right? That long is the game of chess with all possible moves, right? Everything you are allowed to do within the rules of that game, right? There's nothing that says if you are sitting and looking at a chessboard, um, that you can't physically say, take your pawn and make two moves. But once you do that, you're not playing chess anymore. Right? Once you've broken the rules, you're not playing the same game. Parole would refer to an individual move in a chess game, using those rules. And you can only tease out the system of the language by paying attention to those individual moves and how they fit together.
any other questions about any of this? Anything at all that is unclear about this? Anything that anybody's confused about? I give you a minute to let it sink in. Example. You're asking me for an example. example. Okay, an example of what specifically? Uh, the, the log and parole. Uh, well, the entire system thing I get. More so okay. single, the single utterance. But in language, how would you see that single move like that? Okay, so um, if I were to speak or write a sentence, right? Right, the dog sniffed the tree. We can look at this particular sentence to make some conclusions about the rules by which this sentence communicates meaning, right? So we can see that we are looking at a language that has a subject, verb, object, word order for one thing, right? You know, okay, the thing that acts in the sentence comes first, the thing it's doing comes second, and the thing it's doing in two comes last. Right. We can also look at these words in terms of you know, the signs and the concepts they communicate, right? their differentiations from other signs. Right? So if I were to substitute certain words, in this, if I said the log sniffed the tree, the sentence no longer makes sense, right? Because I've chosen an inappropriate sign to perform this particular action on this particular object. Now, there are other signs I could use that might be slightly more, like for example, if you know, the frog sniffed the tree. But sniffing is not an action that we typically associate with frogs, right? So, the relationship between the signs here also tells us something about the concepts communicated. Is this how people make up languages? I don't know if this is how people make up languages. I mean, it seems interesting that a lot of the people, a lot of people who do invent languages um, have a background in linguistics or in philology. I mean, like, for example, um, you know, we, we already mentioned J.R.R. Tolkien, right? He essentially invented <coughs> his secondary world of Middle Earth largely to give his invented languages a place to live, right? That was his hobby when he wasn't, you know, teaching or doing scholarly work. He was doing invented languages. Um, I was thinking Klingon. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, Klingon, I, I, I'm not, I, I think that probably just started as grunting. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I know that there, there are people, <laughs> There are people who have published like Klingon grammars and, and that sort of thing, and, and good for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, that kind of work is all influenced by the kind of work Saussure was doing, right? And you know, this was, as I said, like a real revolution in linguistics, right? This firmly separated linguistics from traditional literary studies. Um, though this system then we're gonna see applied over the next couple of weeks uh, to the study of myth, um, to the study of popular culture, um, and sort of to the study of literature, and even uh, to psychoanalysis, right? The basic idea that they're borrowing from Saussure is that all of these things are signifying systems that are structured like languages. And that if you break them down into their parts, you can see how those pieces fit together, right? You, so it, it's still based on this kind of long parole um, distinction, right? So myth, you know, the long would be like the entire, say, belief system of the Greeks or the Norse or what have you. 
and a parole might be an individual myth. And if we look at how that individual myth compares to other myths in the system, then that, tell, that gives us a picture of what the larger system looks like. All right, what else you got? Anything else? Uh, can you explain iconic again? Okay, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Um, so the three signs are, so an iconic sign is a sign that physically resembles the thing that it represents um, very, very closely. So, you know, I think the example I used was a portrait of George Washington, right? It's a sign, it's not George Washington. It's a sign that stands in for George Washington, but we know it's George Washington because it looks like George Washington. Right, and in that, um, you, you're, you're okay with the other two? Yeah. You got that, okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? I yeah, have a question. Shoot. And with iconic, and I understand the George Washington portrait being iconic because it looks like George Washington. Yeah. But just an average individual, if there is a picture of him, if that's that still would not a, that's, be that's still the, or that's, no, that's still like that's still an icon. Yeah. Okay. The the, the point is not the, the the fame of the thing represented, okay. how widespread knowledge of the thing represented is. The point is the resemblance between okay. Okay. signifier and signified there, right? Thank you. That there is an actual natural physical resemblance between the two. Um, another uh, example of an iconic sign might be, um, you know, if you go, uh, you know, like the, the stick figure representations of a uh, man and a woman on restroom doors. Mm -hmm. Right, they're meant to sort of physically indicate, you know, a man wearing pants and a woman wearing a skirt. So they are really kind of holdovers from an older and more sexist era. Um, and we are actually also about uh, about the only um, the only advanced culture on earth that still does dual sex bathrooms, but that's neither here nor there. Um, <laughs> right. So, yeah. Um, any other questions? Uh, can, we, can you maybe give us another little rundown of the philologist? Philology? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, so a philologist. Um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was someone who studied language and literature in any language. Um, you know, you had people who specialized in, you know, Germanic languages, you had people who specialized in Romance languages, that sort of thing. Um, are you familiar with, you're probably familiar at least a little bit with the Brothers Grimm, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so the Brothers Grimm, like they're most famous for going around and collecting German folk tales. But, like Tolkien, they were philologists first. Their primary interest actually was in the study of languages. So most of their other publications were you know, dictionaries and grammars tracing um, the uh, development of Germanic languages. In fact, there, there's, a, there's a law that's still used in the study of linguistics. It's called uh, Karl Grimm's Law. Um, it's, uh, Jakob Grimm was the first person to um, propose this particular idea. I forget exactly what Grimm's law is because I'm, I'm not a linguist. Um, I come from the other academic branch that descended from philology. Uh, but uh, yeah, so um, you don't really need to know what a philologist is for the exam. Um, but yeah, for historical purposes, right, like I just wanted to demonstrate like that this is kind of a place where historically um, literary studies and linguistics split from each other. Um, and that the diachronic study of language that was the province of philologists is how Saussure is making that division, right? He's moving away from historical evolutionary linguistics towards synchronic linguistics. And Inventing a new discipline in the, in the course of that. All by himself in Geneva over about four years before untimely death. Right. What else you got? Anything else? Simple. Simple? Okay, what about it? What's. Um, I've got one right down. No relationship between the six. No natural relationship between the two. The relationship is dictated by convention 
and by usage. Now, basically, we agree, or we decide that cat stands for the thing we call a cat because everybody who speaks English agrees that it should. Right, so the relationship between the signifier and signified in a symbol is that kind of arbitrary agreement within users of a particular signifying system, right? Does that help? Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, Caleb. Um, in the reading question, so you just covered the, the natural relationship between the signified and the signifier. Uh -huh. uh, it also talks about the instinctual relationship. What does it mean by instinctual relationship? Um, an instinctual relationship would be, you know, like you know, um, some sort of sort of natural mental reason for us to connect uh, okay. these things. Right? And Saucier would argue that there isn't one. Right? Mm -hmm. We only call this creature a cat because everyone around us does. Okay. So as we yeah, so as we're learning to talk and as we're learning to use long, right? As we're learning to use this system, we learn the signs that everybody around <coughs> us uses in this system. You know, if I were to um, walk around um, calling, you know, such a creature, like, say, I don't know, like a spaniel, right? No one would know what the hell I was talking about, right? Even if I point and, you know, to cat say, spaniel, right? No one else calls it that. So maybe in my own little private invented language, that's what it is, right? But it means that I'm not speaking English anymore. It means I'm not speaking the same language everyone around me is. But when, if someone heard you doing that, wouldn't they assume that's what you named the cat? They might assume it's a proper name. Yeah, the point is that like, they wouldn't understand that that's a word I'm using to refer to all cats. They might understand that I might. They might understand that I mean that particular cat. Exactly. But if I refer to all cats that way, particularly if I do so simply in casual conversation without a physical cat to point to, it would be, it's yeah, exactly. Then no one would know what I was talking about. There's a guy um, on the internet. He pronounced. He'll take a something simple and pronounce it the, uh, the name of it. I don't know if y'all ever seen him, but it, it, it's really funny. Yeah, he, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. He, he takes a uh, I guess like grocery store and stuff. Yeah, yeah. that one. He uh, he pronounces it in such a way that you wouldn't. It looks like it, but you would never think to pronounce it like like that. Um, like he calls them like the sour boys. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, and that's that's the same kind of practice, right? It's, it's that you know, yeah, you wouldn't, yeah, unless he's actually pointing at a lemon and saying sour boy, right? You don't know what he's talking about. If he, um, yeah, um, if, if, he, if he walks up to you on the street and says, oh, I just bought a bag of Sour Boys, you're like, great, <laughs> good, good for you. Um, I don't know what those are, because again, no one else calls them that, right? In order to be understood by other users of the system, you have to use the elements of the system. Pardon? Which is plural. Yeah. And you have to use them the same way everyone else does. Yeah, and, and that's how signifier and sign, signifier and signified are related in a symbol. Right? They're related through convention usage. So him purposely mispronouncing words outside the system language. Yeah. Essentially what he's yeah, what he's doing is using a different system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you know, like I said about you know playing a game of chess, right? If you take two moves in one turn, yeah, you can physically do that, but you're not playing chess anymore. Anything else? Yeah, Linda. I was kind of confused, and I might have just been reading too much. On page 157, okay. the era panchronic viewpoint, and I mean, it says not, but I, I don't know if I'm maybe missing something or what okay. I'm trying to work. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't really worry too much about that, that part of it, but what, you know, what he means by pan-chronic, right? Like, what, is, what does pan mean in Greek? 
Does anybody know? Yeah, entire everything, right? So if you are a, a panphobic person, right, you are someone who is afraid of everything. Um, yeah, a pandemic is um, a disease that spreads everywhere, yeah. Um, panic is all-encompassing terror. Um, so, yeah, uh, pan-chronic essentially would, a pan-chronic approach would essentially be a combination of the diachronic and synchronic approaches, right, that looks at how historical evolutional linguistics has led to you know, the present moment that we're trying to pick apart and examine. Um, I think, I mean, what he's, yeah, he is trying to demonstrate that, yeah, that, that is possible, um, but it's also not really what he's doing. Um, he's, more in he's much more interested in the synchronic, yeah. And most of the theorists that are following him are also going to be interested in um, synchronic moments, not necessarily in language, but in the signifying systems that they've chosen to study. Right. Like I said, this can be applied to anything that you can argue is a signifying system. You can look at it according to the same rules. Right. Anything else? I know that this is not, this is probably not a way that we're used to thinking about language, right? Mm -hmm. All right, um, if there are no further questions, I'm going to let you go a little bit early today. Um, I don't have an example to apply this to because, like I said, this isn't really um, something that some people apply directly to literature. The next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at applications of this to literature and culture and other signifying systems. Um, but yeah, I wanted you to understand this before we got into that. And I promise that the other, um, the other structuralist essays we're going to be reading are shorter and a little bit less dense. I like the word prepit. Prepit. Yeah, but it's plain in uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, doesn't that fit, uh, you know, an old man house or a wall that loses his... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we use the adjective to refer to either a structure or to a, or to a person. Yeah, you know, a wall from which mortar is falling and then it being over that. So that's very yeah, important. yeah. So it, it's, it's sort of revealed, like, if you look, think of it, like it reveals an idea of the human body as a structure okay. as well. Yeah. All right, so we'll see you Wednesday. Uh, James, you're up talking about Levi Strauss. Um, and yeah, uh, that's all I got for today. Um, Mickey, uh, just so you know, right, your presentation is on... Monday? Um, you are going to be on... Where the hell is that? I just had it. This sheet. Um, it's going to be on the 17th. And you are going to be presenting on uh, uh, Roland Bart. Oh, so not Monday? <laughs> no, not this coming Monday. No, I, I had to re I had to adjust the presentation schedule uh, because oh. more people at it. Oh, okay, that's fine. So yeah, so your presentation is now on the twenty seventh, uh, the seventeenth of September.